Well, I'll tell you of the text. You can probably tell us tell where we're going, First Timothy. But uh, first of all, before we do that, let me just jump in by uh, um, asking you this question: What do these two people have in common? So the first person is a young person. We have a lot of young people in our church, lots of students, and uh, this first person is a, a student. They're wrestling with the future. They know what they want to do and be, uh, maybe when they're 50 or 60, but that seems like forever away, so far away. Uh, but they're, they're somewhat stressed and anxious to know how to enter into the, the career path. There are so many options, and what best decisions need to be made now in order to get to where I want to go. So that's person number one, or, or person, number, person letter A. But here's the second person or group of individuals, a parent, uh, thinking about poss best possible investments for the resources that God has put in their hands. How far should we stretch ourselves financially? What is a good risk or what is just stupid? Will future markets make our investment look like we were brilliant or will it look like we were smoking something? And they wrestle with those kinds of issues. So, so as you think of person number one, the, the student, and then the second person, maybe a, a parent, what do these two people have in common? Well, we could say that they're at the four corners, uh, a crossroad, that they have options, they have choices uh, that they need to make, and that they need, desperately, discernment. Discernment. Uh, they want to see better than they can see. They want to understand more profoundly than they can understand. Uh, they need to get a, get a grip on what is unfolding so that they can make the wisest move in moving forward. And they both may wrestle at night with that decision, toss and turn as minds race and hearts flutter. I mean, as you think about it, have you ever, ever in your, in your life needed discernment, sound judgment? Or are you that person standing at those four corners this morning? Perhaps, perhaps you, you could place yourself right there. I mean, Bethel Church is in that place these days in a discerning season. Mark and my wife Rhonda are in a season of discernment. You may find yourself this morning in a real season of discernment. The Apostle Paul, as he was thinking of uh, Christians in Philippi, realized that they needed discernment. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 to 11, it says this, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that, so that the result of discernment that you might approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I mean, have you ever prayed for someone that they would have greater discernment? Or have you ever felt sorry for someone lacking discernment? You see their path. You see where they're going. And it's like a cliff. And you think, this is not going to work out well for them. It's kind of like what the writer had in mind in Proverbs chapter 7 in a particular situation. He says, and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense. And then as we think about this issue of discernment, don't we so admire it when we see it in political leaders or corporate leaders where there's such a, a depth of wisdom and there's such a, a consideration given to decisions that are made and, and there's such, such maturity. I, I found a passage, in fact, this is a passage that some of you will have heard. It's referring to uh, David's mighty men that surrounded him and there it is on the on the screen, and this is one group that was surrounding him, of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, 200 chiefs and all their kingsmen under their command. I love that line where it says, they understood the times, they were understanding the times, so to know what Israel ought to do. Discernment. Well, this morning we come to our text, and if you have your Bible, I would strongly encourage you to take your Bible, Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And we've been looking at a section in 1 Timothy that Paul is talking about leadership. And we've been talking about this kind of this theme of uh, leaders are human too. Uh, and therefore, over the last couple of weeks, with the exception of last week when Steve was here, we've been looking at how leaders need encouragement because leaders are human too. 
And then the next week after that, we looked at, well, they need accountability. Like if there's an accusation against a leader, in this particular case, an elder, there should be two or three witnesses. You know, they're human. Leaders are human too. And now we come to this next section, this final section on leadership, where Paul is talking about the issue of discernment and leadership and the appointment of leadership. Such an important issue, right? Because biblically, uh, leadership is accountable uh, in the context of a church for its health and for its direction. There is so much more expected of leadership. And so Paul connects these two of discernment and leadership. But this morning, as we think about leadership for a few moments, you actually may not connect discernment with leadership. You might connect discernment with whatever the issues are for you. Because not everyone here this morning is thinking about church leadership as Paul was thinking about. But I can guarantee you, all of us at certain times in our lives will think about the issue of discernment. And there are a plethora of issues that we need discernment on. For example, here's a listing of some discernment on you know, marriage and job and investments and parenting and church and purchases and retirement and, and moving. And the list is endless, isn't it? I remember back in 2000 and, uh, 2001, uh, my wife and I were uh, wrestling with whether or not to move to Indonesia. And it, it had just, 9-11 had just happened, and it seemed in that context, in that particular day, like an extremely unwise decision to move to the largest Muslim country in the world. And we were really wrestling with this. We had three young children. And we came to the end of that process of discerning, and we ended up moving. And that's, in fact, where we came from. We came from Jakarta, Indonesia, to Bethel Church about 14 years ago. Well, as we come to this text this morning, what does this text tell us about discernment? I think there are some answers in this text from what Paul is writing that will be particularly helpful for all of us. So, if you have your Bibles, let's read the entirety from verse 17 that we've covered right to the end of chapter 6, just to 25, and then we'll jump into our text. So let the elders, so here he's talking about uh, spiritual leaders within the context of a church who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. So that was the week message, or week one message on encouragement. And then do not admit a charge. We had tackled this issue against an elder, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. As for those who persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all, so that the rest may stand in fear. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of the elect angels, I charge you, Timothy, to keep these rules without prejudging, doing nothing from partiality. So this issue of accountability. And now we jump into a section on discernment. Do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. And then in parenthesis, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Verse 24, the sins of some men are conspicuous, they're obvious, going from uh, before them to judgment, but the sins of others appear later. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. So the question this morning as we look at verse 22 to the end of this chapter is what does this text tell us about discernment? There are three answers I want to give you this morning, and I think they really, really will apply to your situation. They really, really apply to Paul's situation, obviously, as he's writing Timothy. The first one that we derive out of this when he says, do not be hasty, is simply this, that discernment is not what we all default to. When Paul says, do not be hasty, he's saying to Timothy in particular, Timothy, you're a young leader, don't be quick, don't be hurried, don't be impulsive, don't, don't get ahead of yourself here. Uh, perhaps Paul, as he's looking at Timothy, he's mentoring Timothy, he's seen how he's performed in the past, he's seeing how he's performing in the present, he understands he has some real challenges coming up ahead. He's telling Timothy in this case, put the brakes on, Timothy. Just slow the process down. I mean, have you ever said to yourself or others, don't be hasty. Slow down. I mean, how many of us right now, if we just ended this sermon and you walked out, that would be all you need this morning. There's my word. Don't be hasty. I'm, I tend to rush to things. 
I just need to slow right down. I got the message. I'm good to go. But we're not done yet. So stay here, right? Now, now of course, Paul is speaking into a particular situation. Timothy is leading the church in Ephesus. Um, however, I think that Paul is highlighting what I would observe as a common problem that still exists today. It doesn't mean everybody's hasty and impulsive, but I think a lot of people are hasty, impulsive. I can be hasty and impulsive. And this situation can look very different in different people's lives. For example, you will either be married to someone like this or your friend will be someone like this. For example, there are people who are direct, decisive, and demanding, and, and, and they, are, they get frustrated in the slow process of decision-making. And they wish the decision could have been made five days ago, and they can't understand why you haven't made the decision now and why you are blocking this process. That's a personality that wants to act now, act quickly. But then there are other types of personalities that are very, maybe a little more controlling, a little more concise. Uh, they, they, they like to have all their, their ducks lined up. And, and, and while data collection is really, really important, they can be victim to, you know, paralysis by analysis, right? And if Paul was to write them in particular, he might actually say the exact opposite. He might say, pick up the pace. Let's, let's, let's move a little, little quicker here. And then there are others that can be forced into a quick, impulsive decision because of fear. And then there are others who can be slow to decide because of the very same emotion, fear. It works both ways. Sometimes anger and bitterness can cause someone to be impulsive. Or how about this one? Sometimes fatigue. Have you ever said this? Let's just get this over with. I am so sick and tired of dealing with dot, dot, dot. Let's just get this done. And as a result, sometimes that quickness or impulsiveness to just get her done can get you in a lot of trouble. <laughs> now, now, who is Paul saying this to? Who, who is Paul addressing? If you said, well, Paul is speaking, Paul is writing to Timothy, you would be absolutely right. He is writing to Timothy. But that's not the whole answer here. Notice he says, do not be hasty. And then he says this, in the laying on of hands. The question is, what does this text tell us about discernment? Well, there's some operating assumptions here. First one is, discernment is not what we default to. Oftentimes, different personalities do not default uh, to discernment. They're sometimes too quick to act. But the second thing is that discernment is best done regardless of who you are in community. You see, verse 22, do not be hasty in the laying on of hands, is not a picture of these four corners. That's not what verse 22 is a picture of necessarily. This is what verse 22 is a picture of, this next picture, the laying on of hands. You see, Paul is referring to a common practice in that day, and we kind of did it through digital with Abby, that's, just the, that's some of the drawback. But in that day, there would be a laying on of hands as a, as a commissioning. So in chapter 4, it's referenced for Timothy. The elders came around Timothy and they laid hands on him as he was, as he was commissioned. It wasn't a solo experience. There was a, there, was a, there was a team. The picture is that we come collectively together around issues to discern, to weigh those, to evaluate those decisions. This is the beauty of team and this is the truth about discernment that applies in the context of selecting church leadership or whatever reason you might find yourself this morning at those four corners. The sermon is done in the context of community. And there's an imagery here that of hands, but we're going to use the four, four uh, corners this morning to illustrate that. I mean, think about these questions. Who has come alongside you to help you discern in the years? Who... Who, who would you insert into that picture right there, that lone guy standing there? Who else would you put in there and say, well, this person helped, this person helped, this person helped in a season of discernment? And then ask this question, what did that person or those people, what did they provide in terms of discernment? What, what perspective did they provide that was helpful? What gift mix did they bring to the decision that was being made that helped you? 
As you think back 10 minutes, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, who has God brought into your four corners? I think, for example, as, as Bethel, a uh, number of examples, over the years, our staff has always met. We meet a couple of hours every week. And one of the things that we've always done is the administrative piece and the, and the pastoral team, we come together for a number of reasons. But one of the things that we often do is we'll say, well, how is your area of ministry going? What's going on in your area? How can we help each other? And sometimes over the years, we have brought issues of, I'm challenged here, I'm not quite sure what to do, and I get mocked out for this, but we dialogue to clarity, or we, or we drill down on issues. And I'll tell you, there have been many times where I'll walk into a meeting and say, I'm not sure what we're going to do, but as we come out of that meeting, because of the men and the women sitting in that particular context of staff, we come out of that with sometimes no clarity at all. But sometimes we come up with real clarity. Real clarity. I think of, for example, the, the current situation where we have a board of directors and we have an elders council. And at Bethel, the elders council have been given the task of finding an interim pastor. Now, if you've been reading all the notes, you know that we're still kind of striking out on that. But the way the process works is that we identify an individual uh, through a large pool uh, the, the elders, not myself, the elders now, they interview that individual, character, competency, competency, chemistry, what's the Spirit of God saying in this context. And if the elders feel comfortable, then that person's name is passed onto the board of directors. And then a couple of board of directors, along with a couple of elders, now join that team with some staff, and they look at an individual, and they assess that individual. And we've done that a few times, but like I said, we haven't landed one yet. <laughs> But that's a process of discernment, a process of team. Uh, I mean, I can imagine a lot of you identify with this. If you work in an organization, I mean, over the last couple of years as a church, my goodness, the board has come together with the elders and then the staff. And my, we have, as I've said, it's like we got on a rocket ship and landed on Mars and nobody had a manual on how to figure things out. And we looked to our premier and we looked to our prime minister. We looked to the globe and everybody was writing the manual and we were making it up as we went along. Well, hopefully not. But that collaborative process of discerning and weighing and saying, man, we've never been on this planet before. How do we move through this? And I can tell you that there's a wonderful expression of collaboration. Does it always work perfectly? Not at all. But we're the board and the elders, and then sometimes the staff comes into that, and we collaborate. Now, there are many issues that don't need discernment. Wouldn't you agree with that? There are a lot of things that are really simple to figure out. For example, if, you know, in life, if you're driving down the highway and you see a speed limit of 80 kilometers an hour, you, you, you don't need discernment to know whether or not if you should obey. Now, if you do practice discernment, then there's a very likely chance that there'll be a red cherry in your rearview mirror following you and you probably don't need discernment to try to figure out whether you should pull over it's true isn't it there's there's a lot of things in life there's a lot of decisions in life that are kind of like this on this next slide like this equation two plus two equals four if i asked you this morning how many of us have two plus two equals four kinds of decisions you'd say i do i do i do i do it's not rocket science it's not hard to figure out it's not hard to determine. You don't scratch your head and sweat and have an upset stomach and toss and turn at night. It's just two plus two equals four. But we know that all of decisions in life don't equal that first equation. They more look like the second equation, don't they? Where there are other factors in the equation that make it hard to figure out what actually it equals and how it adds up and what it's going to look like. And some of those other factors could be like time, like what effect will time have upon our decision today? Or maturity, if you're looking at a, putting someone in a place of leadership in the church or in the corporate world, you might say, well, they're mature, but we don't have a 360 or, you know, but we're trying to assess that person and we're not, we're not sure how they're going to perform in that role. They, they're mature, but... Will they continue to grow or have they plateaued and, and therefore not really excel in their new role? And so there's issues of maturity. Sometimes there's issues of temperament, right? Where discerning is hard. Like if you're a parent and you're learning how to 
raise your child. Every child is different. Uh, it's, they're, they're not cookie cutter, right? They're, every child is different, and you try to discern as a parent their temperament, their maturity, their perspectives, their experiences, and trying to weigh how to manage sometimes how to discipline a child or the market. If we buy now, are we buying high? If we buy now, are we buying low? How many of us are facing two plus two equals four? Lots of us. In fact, I would say that sometimes when the equation is really simple, it's not so simple. Because two plus two equals four, yes. So discernment, I uh, don't really need a lot of discernment. It's fairly simple. But sometimes simple decisions or things that are really clear need a lot of courage. And so you say, well, I don't, I, I don't need a lot of discernment right now. It's clear. But do I have the courage to do what I need to do? I mean, how many of us are facing situations that reflect more of the second equation? About five or six years ago now, uh, my wife and went back to school um, she, to, to get a master's in counseling. Um, and that decision, I think it was five or six years ago, right, honey? More. Okay, she's saying, no, whatever, just go for it. Uh, so, <laughs> 22 years ago, my wife went back to school and... Uh, that's, yeah, and just don't ask me when my anniversary is. Uh, and uh, I know exactly when it is. And, uh, and so as we were working through that, th there were some things that were clear about that decision. Two plus two, it's just simple. But then there were other factors that were, hmm, not so sure. And, and we weighed it, we prayed about it. It was actually, I think, a long period of time. And then we came to the conclusion that she would go back. And when we got clarity, then we needed courage. Because the clarity didn't mean the path was smooth. The clarity meant, okay, this is the way we're going to walk, and now we're going to need a lot of courage. And now my wife is my retirement package, so thank you very much, honey. I really appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> so so some, some decisions are, are hard, some decisions are easy, but even on the easy ones, sometimes there's a lot of courage that is needed and there's a couple of cautions here. One caution is obviously be careful of who you bring around you for insight. You know, it's, it's a team approach. It's, I think of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. You remember when he took over and Solomon had a heavy yoke on the people and, and uh, Rehoboam went to the, his council, his old guys, and they said, well, you know, your father really oppressed the people with a heavy yoke. You should lighten it. He went to the young guys and they said, no, you should actually make it even heavier and he followed bad counsel, and he ended up seeing a red cherry in his rearview mirror. He got pulled over, and he's no longer king. That was trouble. But, but here's another caution on this. This whole idea of discernment is done in community. And this is one that you might not think about, but it's so true. And I think we all have examples of this. When we open ourselves up to counsel, we make ourselves vulnerable. Do you not agree? Wise counsel is not always easy to hear. Uh, think of Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Uh, one writer writes this. He paraphrases this verse, first of all, by saying, this is how it, he, he paraphrases it more closely to the Hebrew. Trustworthy are the bruises caused by the wounding of one who loves you. And then he says, the bruise that comes after the verbal blow of one who loves you is a trustworthy bruise. Interesting. In genuine love, your friend confronts you, your parent perhaps, with the truth. You're alone, you're in private, and you hear the hard things that need to be confronted. That bruise stays with you, you're a better person for it. Such bruising, the author says, is much more helpful and reliable than a phony embrace, like the kiss of a flatterer whom Solomon calls our enemy. Good counsel is a good thing, even if it hurts to hear it whether you're the receiver or the giver of that counsel. Sometimes when we open ourselves up, correct, to decision-making, sometimes the wounds of a friend uh, can be felt very, very deeply because some hard things need to be said, perhaps, in those moments. Well, let, let's notice where Paul continues to go here to our last answer to our, our question. Notice... Um, we carry on here, so do not be hasty in the laying on of hands. And then he goes in a direction, and if you read various commentaries on this verse, this kind of is like uh, someone taking a, a hard right real fast, and you'll lose them. And you go, where'd they go? Where'd they go? 
And so, or what, 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 it's hard to follow Paul here a little bit. And so there's different ways of kind of understanding perhaps what Paul is saying. We're not going to spend time on that. But he goes, he says, laying on of hands, nor take part in the sins of others. Keep yourself pure. So he's certainly referring back to what he has said often in this letter. Timothy, watch your life. Self-leadership is really important. There's lots of great leaders out there that don't lead themselves well, and then they collapse. And so keep yourself pure. And as you're thinking about other leaders, you know, perhaps this is what he's getting at, nor take part in the sins of others. Like, there are leaders out there that have fallen, so be careful. Watch yourself. And, but then he, then he goes off even a little bit further. This is where you kind of maybe even lose his taillights. Like, okay, wh where's he going here? No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. So why in the world would Paul raise this? He's talking about don't be hasty in laying on of hands. And, and he's talking about, you know, spiritual health, like keep yourself pure. And now he's talking about physical health because uh, recommending uh, wine in that day was kind of a, it was a medical believed uh, cure for a digestive problem. Uh, maybe uh, Timothy, they suggest, might have had an ulcer or uh, he was stressed out. So, so Paul is looking at Timothy and perhaps because of the leadership issues, he's recognizing in Timothy, you know, you got to guard yourself spiritually, but there's this, there's this physical element, too, that you need to take a little wine for your stomach, deal with your stress, deal with your anxiety. And then he comes back to don't be hasty in laying on of hands, because notice what he says in verse 24. I mean, there's one more thing that Paul wants to say. He says this, the sins of some men are conspicuous, going before them in judgment, but the sins of others appear later. Notice the contrast. Now the positive. So also good works are conspicuous, and even those that are not cannot remain hidden. He's, he's referring to what some authors refer to as the iceberg principle. You don't see the whole iceberg. So what else could Paul have to say about discernment? Here's the third thing, last thing I want to say about discernment, the bottom line of that slide. Discernment helps us see what haste may blind us to. What you may need discernment on may have nothing to do with where Paul is making immediate application, and that is leadership in a church. Yet it's so applicable to whatever you may be trying to discern. Discernment helps us see what haste may blind us to. Paul says what? He says, when you look at a man for leadership, or you look at an individual for leadership in this particular context, that there are some things that are conspicuous. And there are other things that will trail behind. So be cautious. See, in Paul's immediate context of application, if you act with haste, you may not see things as they truly are. You may miscalculate. You may thus uh, appoint wrong leadership. Or if you're cautious, you may see some things that a quick decision uh, may, uh, may have not allowed you to see as is sped on the next slide. If you're cautious, you may see some things that a quick decision may have not allowed you to see. So imagine standing at those four corners and so, you know, you're looking at all your options and all of us have been here before, right? And on Monday you're looking down, you know, you're looking down this option and you're weighing it, you're doing all the things that you need to do and then you sleep on it and Tuesday comes and you look down this option and then Wednesday comes, you look at that option, and Thursday comes, you look at that option, and you're tossing and you're turning and you're praying about it and you're trying to discern it with your friends, and you come to Friday, and what sometimes happens? You see things on Friday you didn't see on Monday, and thank God you didn't make the decision you would have made on Monday because giving it some time allowed you to see some things, and on Friday you make a completely different decision. Haste can blind us. And so notice in this text, Paul says in verse 22, don't be hasty, Timothy. Verse 24 is almost like, if you didn't get it in verse 22, get it in verse 24. If you, if you somehow flew by that, Timothy, don't be hasty in the laying on of hands, then I want you to slow down at verse 24, and I want you to get this. You will not see everything in the first drive-by. You need to drive by a couple of times so if you didn't get it in verse 22, get it in 24, slow down, Timothy. I mean, would you agree that quick decisions blind us to seeing important details? Would you agree that haste robs us of seeing all the information? 
We, we label something in a wrong way. We identify something incorrectly. In Paul's context, we allow someone to step into leadership when they're just not ready for that position. We mislabel. We misidentify. Like this interesting story of this lady that walked into a Goodwill store. Some of you read this story. And she saw this Roman bust, I think it was underneath a table. Uh, Bob Simpson and Melinda, you guys, you guys would love this deal. Those guys are for great deals and flipping. And so this is the ultimate flip. This is the ultimate flip. She buys this Roman bust for $34. It turns out to be a missing Roman bust from the first world, Second World War. And she flips it and sells it for $63,000 because it was the real deal. I mean, think of the church. How messy can church get when mis we mislabel leadership? And thus, men and women get into leadership and they should not be there. That's the original context. As some have said, it's easy to scramble eggs. You know the rest of that? But it's really hard to unscramble eggs. I mean, think of your own personal decision on discernment. What kind of mess did you and I create when, when acting in haste, mislabeling? How grateful have you been when not acting in haste and making a right decision? How grateful are you for the person who said, wait? How often have you ever said, my wife and I have said this over the years, man, we dodged a bullet. <laughs> we dodged a bullet. And we are grateful we did not act in haste. But, but what's the tension of that scenario? Well, the tension is, and I think you'll relate to this, you can do all the right things, right? You can look at 1 Timothy and you can look at James and ask, say, pray to God and ask for wisdom. You can do all the right things in discernment and you can still make the wrong decision. <laughs> and that's where the wine thing comes in, I think, you know, where you need a little wine or something. I mean, over the years at uh, Bethel, I can see excellent decisions that I was part of that involved discernment. And I can see bad decisions that were made while practicing the same priority of discernment. But I also see this, where God uh, has at times, many times, protected us and allowed us to land in a good place, even though the systems were faulty. And aren't you grateful that as an individual, you know you blow it, you make bad decisions, I make bad decisions, but God is sovereign. And he has the ability, it doesn't mean we're indifferent, right? It's not a license for immorality, as Paul might say. But he has the ability to say, yeah, you really messed this one up. But I'll, I'll redeem it. And I'll restore it. And we can actually make this thing work. I mean, welcome uh, to a fallen world, right? Where our spiritual antennas don't always get it right. For sure. What, one last word of caution before we come to the end. You'll note as you read Timothy that there are a number of times that Timothy talks about the enemy. He talks about the, the enemy of our souls. In 1 Timothy 2, uh, he talks about the deception by the enemy. In chapter 4, verse 1, he talks about deceitful spirits when talking about false teachers. When talking about widows in that text that we looked at, he talks about uh, a straying after Satan. See, I think one of the ways that the enemy works, and I think this is why Paul is saying don't act in haste, is one key way for Satan to bring down a church is either get wrong leaders leading or cause good leaders to fall. And that was happening in Ephesus. See, here's a truth that is for all of us in whatever we're discerning. That when you are in a battle, and we're all in a battle, there's a spiritual element to our life. There's a spiritual backdrop. When you are in a battle, the enemy, one of his strategies is to disable discernment. When you are up against it, I believe very, very wholeheartedly on this, that the enemy will do everything he can to somehow per, perhaps, perhaps hurry you along and act impulsively, or maybe to be too slow, because that can be an issue as well. But the enemy will do everything he can to disable discernment. And if he disables discernment, then he can bring down an organization. He can bring down a church when it comes to this issue of leadership. Or he can make your life really messy. I am sure that a lot of us, maybe all of us, would have a testimony on that and say, you know, there was a time when I was not as attentive to God as I should have been. 
And the enemy disabled my discernment in that moment. And I made huge mistakes. Huge mistakes. But remember, God is sovereign. <laughs> He's sovereign. Thank God for his sovereignty. Well, uh, as we close, in the, uh, just in the last few minutes here, um, I, ca I came across this definition of discernment as we walk this out in our lives this week. And I, and I think it's a good dis definition that I think the Apostle Paul would really agree with. It says this, discernment is given by God through his Holy Spirit. It is received through God's word and through the insight of a renewed mind. Together, discerning believers seek to grow in their understanding and knowledge of God's truth. I think if we put that before Paul here, I think Paul would say, I agree with that. Because if you look at the first part, discernment is given by God through his Holy Spirit. Well, remember the letter of Ephesians? Paul wrote... Ephesus. T Paul, Timothy's a pastor in Ephesus. And he, and he said, don't get drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul in Galatians talks about keeping in step with the Spirit of God. Certainly discernment would land, land in that as well, as you are trying to discern, keep in step with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Notice the other part, it is received through God's Word and through the insight of a renewed mind. You remember, Paul writes a second letter, 2 Timothy. And it's in that letter that more famous passage where he says all scripture is God breathed, profitable for teaching, rebuke, training in righteousness. The, the word of God is, is to, to direct us and to guide us and, and, and to lead us. And then renewing of the mind, well, it was Paul that wrote Romans 12, 1 and 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that what? You might know what the good, perfect, acceptable will of God is. A renewed mind and discernment are deeply, deeply connected. And then together, discerning believers seek to grow in their understanding and knowledge of God's truth. Body of Christ. Did Paul have anything to say about the body? He, he likened the church to uh, a Roman soldier, but in Corinthians, he likens it to the human body. And he has the body parts talking to each other. It's the origination of Sesame Street. It's an amazing passage, right? where the ear talks to the eye and the eye talks to the nose, and I can't live without you. It was Paul that wrote that beautiful text on the body of Christ. See, the challenge of the day is to slow down because if we don't and we act in haste, haste will rob us of discerning. What sometimes we do is we take bits and pieces of biblical discernment but leave out other important parts. For example, couple examples here we we say well discernment is given by God through his Holy Spirit and you know we just want the spirit to drop mail in the mailbox but we're not students of the word our minds aren't renewed and we're not in community and I've had people come to me and I'm sure you've had some people come to you and you say they say well the Spirit of God is leading me well that's great but are you in the Word of God and is your mind being renewed and are you in community? Because if you're not, without those checks and balances, I would highly question what the Spirit of God is saying to you. Because discernment is the, is the theater of all of those disciplines that help us. But we have a tendency at times to be, oh, we're just being led by the Spirit. Well, that's necessary, but there's other elements to discernment. Or here's another temptation, you know. Uh, it is received through God's Word. But we neglect asking the Spirit. We're not very Spirit-focused or engaging in community, and our, our mind is not being renewed. And so what we do is we, we use the Bible as kind of a, like with our index finger. Ever done this? You just, it flops open and you go, what should I do? Say, say someone is wrestling with whether I should relapse into alcoholism, and they go, boom, and, and Jesus said, you know, those who thirst, come to me and drink. And they go, well, there it is. There it is. Did you see how wacky it can be? There, there's other aspects uh, to discernment. It's so necessary. Well, here's one more. We say discernment is given by God through his Holy Spirit, is received through God's word and through the insight of a renewed mind. That's all true, but we, we don't need others. We don't need others, and it's kind of like a hockey player fully outfitted, you know, 
Don't think of Montreal Canadiens because they're all golfing right now. Uh, well, so are the Toronto Maple Leafs. They're golfing as well. But think of a, maybe an active hockey player, fully outfitted, stick and puck, but they don't belong to a team. You'd say, well, are you a player? How can you be a player if you're not part of a team? And we neglect people around us. The challenge this morning is engagement with discernment. Slow down, perhaps, is the word for you. Slow down. But also pray for Bethel, for discernment in these important days, and pray for each other, as many of us find ourselves at the four corners of important decision-making. So will you pray with me this morning as we conclude and as we just take a moment to lift up some of our needs to God this morning as we need discernment? Lord, many of us find ourselves at the four corners, uh, decisions to be made that will deeply affect others and ourselves. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed this morning, as we just kind of focus, we are asking for wisdom by your Spirit, through your Word. Surrounded by wise counsel, as our minds are renewed and transformed, as we submit to your leading, we are asking for wisdom. Let's just pause here in this time of prayer, in this time of silence, and whether you're online or whether you're in our building, and just take a moment to present a decision that you were perhaps in the process of making. You're saying, Lord, here's my four corners. Here's the thing that I'm wrestling with. Here's the thing that I'm trying to discern. Here's the thing that I'm staying up at night. This wakes me up. Here's the issue. Perhaps if you don't have clarity, ask him for patience to wait for clarity. Perhaps your prayer is for courage to act on what you know. Perhaps ask him for a few godly voices to come around you. Perhaps you need courage to ask for help in figuring something out. Or perhaps as you pause, thank him for discernment that's been given on all kinds of issues. Thank him for forgiveness. Thank him for a second chance when you haven't been very discerning. You've been led by other impulses and desires and ambitions and you weren't discerning. Thank him for forgiveness. Thank him for his sovereignty that he can restore and make you better than ever, stronger than ever, brighter than ever. Lord, help us to yield to you, surrender to you in this process, to walk in obedience and courage. Give us your power and resulting freedom to move into your purposes. Lord, we want to be a vessel shaped by you at the four corners. Like new wine, do a deep, fresh new work in our hearts and seasons of discernment and then acting. Might our discernment result in good works that Paul talks about that are conspicuous to all, that bless many, strengthen hearts and advance your kingdom. Help us to find your peace in the process and rest in the labor of discernment. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.